incredible changing landscape in college football and, and, and really in the SEC, which is going to be undergoing some major changes soon. But first, Clay, I got eight photos of fish from you the other day. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, you got a bucket list trip taken care of, man. So congratulations. Looked like it was a pretty successful trip. Yeah, it was pretty cool. I, I spent a few days in uh, Loveland, Colorado with uh, Jeremiah Gage, who's from Ozark. And he and his wife, Ginger, kind of hosted me, and I just kind of got my bearings. You know, when I go out there and get into altitude, for about a day and a half, you know, I, it's it just kind of puts me out of sync. You know, I think, oh, shortness of breath, it's COVID, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, no, you're just, you're just adjusting to altitude. And my quarters at his house are in the basement, and you come up those stairs. It's a long flight of stairs. He's got a beautiful house in a out on the west end of Loveland, just as the big Thompson flows through there right by his house, and there's elk, and not this time of year, but he has hmm. yeah, all of those things. You know, it takes me a little while to get my bearings, and then off we go. And and in this particular trip, off off we went was just me solo because my two buddies out there, they were it didn't really work for this trip. They both had duties. Uh, Jim Daniel, who's from Fush Valley, Arkansas, and lives near Greeley, his grandkids were coming in from Bosnia after uh, his daughter is a missionary there, and they've been pretty much stuck for the last two years because of COVID. And, you know, the date I could get for the guide on the Miracle Mile of the North Platte near Casper corresponded when they were going to get off a plane in Dallas. I was like, man, you you, you go. <laughs> I mean, it, it didn't really matter if I told him to go or not he was going. You know, that's just, you got to go hug on your grandkids if you hadn't seen them in that long. But it's, uh, so I the I went to the Wind River, um, fished that, caught a few, but I did that solo um, around Thermopolis and not far from Yellowstone, only about 120 miles south of Yellowstone. The Wind River is just gorgeous through that canyon, and you're on the Indian Reservation. You've got to get uh, – anyway, I won't go into that. And then cut across three hours in north-central Wyoming, which is just gorgeous. And, I mean, no trees. It's sand mountains, I call them. I mean, just, you know, you're going through at elevation, but it's all just kind of sand and high desert. Went to Casper, had a great steak, uh, sat at, a, at the bar and, you know, ate a big old bone-in ribeye. And the next morning floated with uh, Crazy Rainbow, the best outfitter in that area. Mm-hmm. Um, Michael Graham, whose granddad was director of Wyoming Game and Fish, so he's, you know, fourth generation Wyoming night. And we just we just knocked them dead on the North Platte, the Miracle Mile, which is actually five miles long. And every fish we caught was over 20 inches, and a couple of them were almost two feet, you know, 24 inches. So it was fantastic. Well, and, and I see your photographic <laughs> evidence of this, too. So, I mean, you're Oh, not, yeah, you're, we took pictures. And at first, I didn't want to hold these. These are trophy fish, and, they're, you know, their prizes, those guides take a lot of – care with i was like i'll drop one and he's like no you're gonna have you're gonna hold him and he held the net underneath it and we got our hands slimed up so we don't hurt the fish you know you just when they're that kind of fish and that kind of special place you just want to make sure you take real good care of them and uh but it was it's fantastic and then now there was a there was thoughts that i was going to stay an extra couple of days and make it kind of a nine-day trip and go to the Frontier Days Rodeo in Cheyenne uh, and hear Cody Johnson, who I think Cody's actually seen uh, at Peacemaker. That's right. Um, and uh, But to see him, you know, in the Cheyenne Frontier Days Rodeo Arena, an outdoor, you know, 24,000, uh, and him, him seeing Deer Rodeo to those people uh, <laughs> would be – I've seen George Strait at Frontier Days. My buddies out there always – take good care of me you know uh jim and in and, and jeremiah so and i should say ginger too because i know she has to put up with me but it's uh i did a lot i did about three days all by myself and did these drives in wyoming and colorado with these majestic vistas and i don't i don't mind fishing by myself now you know if you're a guide you're not by yourself but i'll go solo wade fishing into the mountains and that's great 
you know, relaxation to me and sit down on a rock and eat a cliff bar or something and just enjoy. You talk about the sunset, just enjoy the sounds of the river. Gosh, that sounds absolutely gorgeous, Clay. Stick around. We're going to get into this uh, into college. Yeah, I'm sorry. I know that's what people no, want to No, no, not at all. I, I really like the, the pictures you're painting there. You also mentioned Cody Johnson. He's going to be playing at the Peacemaker on the 30th and 31st this weekend. All ages welcome at peacemakerfest.com for tickets. Maybe a select few VIPs are still available. Park gates open 5 p.m. Friday, 4 p.m. Saturday. You can bring camping-style lawn chairs. Low-back chairs are also allowed to rain or shine. And uh, this, of course, is right downtown Fort Smith at the beautiful Riverfront Amphitheater. Cody Johnson joined by Paul Cothran, Muscadine Bloodline, Giovanni and the Hired Guns, Tanner Ustry, Colby Cooper, Band of Heathens, much more. It's the Peacemaker Festival in Fort Smith, peacemakerfest.com. That's this weekend. Right back after this. Bend him in there for Waylon if there's two things to not let your babies grow up to be. Cowboy, maybe one of them. Longhorn, that's another one. We'll get to that hmm. in a minute with Clay Henry. That's Ronnie good. in Hot Springs has called us up on halftime here. Hey, Ronnie, what's going on? Uh, no, it's, it's Ryan in Hot Springs. Well, Ryan, you can play Ronnie or you My can mistake. be Ryan, whichever one you want. You can be whoever you want. Uh, well, I, I prefer to be Ryan. But, okay. uh, uh, you got it, I Ryan. actually called to talk to... Talk to Clay if he's still there. I'm here. Okay. Um, was that your first uh, first trip out there to the, the Miracle Mile? My first trip to the Miracle Mile. I've been a lot of places west, Montana, but yeah, that was it. Now I'll go back. It's 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 a bucket list place. So um, it's a lot's going to have to happen for me, but uh, I'm hoping next October to go out there. I've got a buddy of mine that uh, goes out there every couple of years. He goes on a uh, antelope, uh, mostly antelope, but uh, couple, every, every now and then he'll get a uh, mule deer tag. But anyway, uh, I'm hoping to be able to go out there on that hunt next year. And that's kind of on the uh, bucket list. If we can get our tags filled quickly enough, we're going to try to fish the Miracle Mile. And uh, I just uh, was hoping if you had a little more time, if uh, you tell him more about it. And uh, A couple of years ago, he did catch a uh, really big brown, I want to say it was a four or five pounder, that, uh, that he caught out there on the Miracle Mile. And uh, he had, a couple of years ago, he was telling me that uh, he had uh, had, had an eight-pounder on that uh, got off out of the bank. It was a uh, little Cleo he was uh, fishing with. Yep. And then, you can uh, just fish right a, on the uh, bank. Yeah. Right. Well, I hope you all have a good day and go hogs. Thanks, Ronnie. Thanks, Ronnie. Uh, Clay did a it really put a, a beautiful column together at Whole Hog Sports uh, about his uh, experience. There's some detail the in there. Yep, yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, Ron, if you got access to it, and even if you don't have a membership, you you know they give you. You can do one. You can read months. one, three in a month, or something like that. Yeah, that's right. All right, Clay. So, uh, the Big Twelve was set on fire last week. The SEC is going to have two new conference members. It's not official yet, but let's just be honest about this. Mm, I think a lot of people cool. would expect that you would you would be the one saying, "No, we don't. I don't want anything to do with Texas." You're on the other end of that, though, aren't you? Yeah, I mean, this is my 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 feeling. You know, you. You keep your friends close, you keep your enemies closer. And it's, uh, you know, if if there is something good about Texas, it will add value to your league, and the money is going to go up, and certainly with the Sooners, the same thing. And, you know, what's Arkansas getting, 40 or $50 million now? Per year, it'll go up to a 90 or 100. Just mm-hmm. Just think about doubling what, you know, the conference gives to each team. And it's the... You know, without question, Coach Burles wanted Texas to come along. And the problems with Texas were always that they could dominate the discussion, you know, in the back rooms, the league meetings uh, in the Southwest Conference, and they they did that in the formation of the Big Eight. But they're going into a league now that's one team, one vote. And that's the way you want it. And they're not going to be able to alter the – you know the revenue split. They're not going to be able to alter the way the referees are assigned. You you finally got Texas where you want them, and Texas, Texas is uh, you know they're not the Texas of old right now. I mean I, mm-hmm. this is the time you want them, and I I I think that uh, that's a good thing. The Sooners different beast. I mean they're they're rolling pretty good in football, um, but. I think that for both of those teams, I mean, here's the thing. You're not going to add those two teams to your schedule. You're still just going to play eight. And they got to play eight. And 
I think both of those teams got a chance to lose two, three, four games. They lose a quarterback or a key player or whatever. I mean, it's this is is as my dad told me when we were at the board of trustees meeting when the South Southeast Conference move was announced. I mean, you knew it was coming, but that was when it became official. He said, this will be like playing Texas every week. And for Texas, it'll be like playing Texas every week. Yeah, it will. And you talked about how the Oklahoma is obviously better in a better situation in football. But the more I hear and the more that people talk about it, write about it, it still feels like Texas is the bigger get. So, I mean, are they really, even though they haven't been that good in football for uh, almost a decade and OU hasn't missed a CFP yet? Yeah, I mean it's it, Texas is still Texas, and and it's uh, and Oklahoma has had some magic against Texas. But if you go back and you look at Texas' record through the years, pretty good, mm-hmm. um, and pretty good against Oklahoma, and uh, maybe not in the last thirty years. But it's uh, um, you know I'd say you know that both of them are great gets, and they're, they're both worth a lot i mean it's it's the revenue is going to be intense and it's uh you know you wonder you know things you know there's there's more out there i mean you know what if what if a couple of acc schools decide you know that's 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 30 to 40 million more you know that's i'm i'm talking about clemson now south carolina probably wouldn't like that but Texas, but south carolina cannot block that just like texas a&m could not block you know one vote in, in this conference does not carry much weight. Texas, with one vote, could carry a lot of weight in the Big 12 or the Big 8 or the Southwest Conference because they, they, they held the trump card. They were Texas. But it's not that way in the SEC, which is why Arkansas should always be there. You know, and one aspect, too, and Jason from Frankfurt's on hold here, so I want to get to this call in a moment. One aspect of this as well is, I don't know if this is the, the way I look, I view the ACC with this, but it's amazing to see how the Big Ten and the Pac-12 have just been caught off guard by this, totally off guard. And the SEC is the one that's leading, uh, essentially, the empowering of the leagues uh, away from the NCAA. All right, Jason, he's called in from Frankfurt. What's going on? You're on halftime. Hey, good to talk to you guys. Clay, if you'd answer this as well. My question is a little more immediate future. What margin of victory versus Rice or what result versus Rice is going to get you genuinely excited for this Texas game? Uh, is it going to be a defensive shutout like where Rice puts up a goose egg? Is it going to be a 21-point margin of victory? Is there something that you have in your mind that, like, if I see this score, I'm going to be genuinely excited for this Texas game? Just well, your just you your opinions that. on that. Yeah, so the bottom line is I'm already excited for Texas, mm-hmm. and that's the problem. So any victory, you move on to the Texas game. The, the, it doesn't matter. I mean, when you say Texas, I'm, I'm ready to throw down. I mean, I roll up my sleeves and I say, here we go, baby. And I, I don't, I mean, you just get by that first game and anything can happen in the first game. And when you say excited that I'm the wrong guy to ask that, maybe you guys can, can, uh, can handle that. Cause, I, you know, I kind of just, I'm at an even keel until, uh, you know, wins, losses, whatever. They, they don't destroy me. I, I guess I'm probably at 67. I'm, I'm past that. Uh, y'all already know what excites me and it's a, you know, it's an eight-pound brown. <laughs> so, so y'all, y'all answer that question. I see where, and I think I, I know what Jason means a little more here yep. than like your excitement for the Texas game because you're going to be excited about that no matter what. Six no o'clock, question. September 11th, ESPN, Longhorns. I think that really it's like, what would the final score in the Rice game? How would that make you feel about the team? Really, just that know, day. moving yeah. forward. Yeah, just that day. <laughs> And honestly, yeah. I think you have to throw in the factor of what Texas looks like in week one against Louisiana. If they, if Louisiana is able to play Texas neck and neck and give them a good three, three and a half quarters, you get even more excited because you know that Steve Sharkees is still trying to work on some stuff and doesn't have everything solid down by week two. Yeah, the the betting line, which you know everybody says three touchdowns, right? It's twenty twenty one, right? And that what it is? I never look at that. They, that doesn't 
define my expectations. I probably will look at did they, you know, I go through a set of circumstances. Can they make third and one against Rice? Can they, you know, were they, you know, they're, were they, you know, did they have a decent third down conversion? Could they get, could they rush the passer? Was there any pressure? Those are probably the specific things I look at in, in not what the score was. Yeah. And again, well, the first week of the season, you know, that, uh, it's it can be fool's gold. What's the kicking game like? Of, of, they, mm-hmm. Have they have they corrected special teams things that seem to be problems early last year? Mm-hmm. Jason, appreciate the phone call, man. It's good to hear. Yeah, it's good you. thought. It is, and I mean that that is what's right ahead of you. And I think also the point that he's making, and this is a point that I tried to make a couple weeks ago. You know, we're going to make a huge deal out of the Texas game. That we'll, we'll be on on Labor Day that mm. week because it's Texas week. But it's almost like. We're forgetting that that's not the first game of the season. You play Rice first, 